I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute, and I'm here with Professor Joe Ellis, and we've been talking about the Constitution. Now, when they don't use the word slavery, tell us that we have Charles Coatworth Pickney sort of doing the uh, Southern side of it, which is, I think he says uh, that about, you know, why they can't eliminate slavery. South Carolina and Georgia cannot do without slaves. They've, they've gotten a cotton economy that's dependent on clearing swamps for uh, cultivation. Uh, no white man will do that labor. And they are also dependent on a continuation of the slave trade. They get their way with that. It's it continued for 20 years. So that there are several compromises that involve slavery. So when the abolitionist movement comes along 50 years later, the leaders of the abolitionist movement called the Constitution a covenant with death. Right, and, and um, it was definitely a compromise. It was a compromise, and people at the time, and they're even historians now, they write, you know, slavery in the Constitution kind of books in which they, they sort of pound the founding fathers over the head here. Let's go back to that moment. If they had confronted slavery directly, if they had called South Carolina, Georgia, and to some extent Virginia onto the carpet here and said, we are going to put slavery on the road to its ultimate extinction, what would have happened? You wouldn't have got the Constitution. And I think that's absolutely clear. That's not a... In other words, South Carolina and Georgia would not have become part of the United States. So you couldn't have had one United States. Right. And you have to make the compromise and fight it out later, basically. Postpone it in the hope that, you know, like when you say something good will happen, they actually think, some of them in the North believe, that slavery is going to die a natural death. Right. That it's, it can't compete with free labor. They, they don't foresee the cotton kingdom. They don't foresee the cotton gin. And John Adams is the one who says to John Quincy later, 18, 18, 18, 19, when the Missouri crisis, that I always thought we were going to solve this peacefully. Now I know we're not. Go get them, baby. So occasionally you make the compromise for practical, pragmatic reasons, and it ends up being morally ambiguous, and you have to resolve it later. Correct. And, you know, George Washington, let's end with him. He's rather interesting. He owns mm. 100 slaves, right, when he comes to the convention? 200. 200 slaves. He, when he dies, he owns 317. And he brings with him to the convention, the Constitutional Convention. When they're writing about this, he brings with him... Three, Three slaves. slaves. And his, his manservant, his valet, is a slave called Billy Lee. Billy Lee is, uh, is a slave he bought when he was 17 years old in 1768 to accompany him on the fox hunt. He's the only person who could keep up with Washington on a horse. And then he's with him throughout the whole war. And Every, he is standing there in Philadelphia. Let's stand, imagine this scene. Washington is, sitting, Washington Washington is sitting at the big chair. Billy Lee is standing. There are actually prints of this. Okay, we're not making this up. We can find yeah, it. Yeah, here. Let's look right and, here. There's a, uh, yeah, here's a picture <laughs> of it. Yes. And uh, uh, standing off to the side, handing him papers when he wants to send a message to one of the delegates sitting somewhere else, getting him water. And he's listening to this debate about him. And you wonder, what's he thinking? What is Billy Lee thinking? What is Billy Lee thinking? And what is George Washington thinking? And what, I think George Washington is not thinking about Billy Lee. I, I don't, or worrying about Billy Lee. Um, you know, this is one of the great discussion points of our time, which is when do you compromise hmm. and when do you hold true to moral principles? I'm sure you're right that if they hadn't have compromised, you wouldn't have had a constitution with all 13 states being involved. But you can argue, and I guess that's one of the great things about American history, was that a moral compromise or an immoral compromise? And by postponing it, we finally had to resolve it with the Civil War. Right? And 632,000 people are going to have to die. Lincoln thought it was worth it. The compromise? Yeah, well, and the war itself. You know, the second inaugural is about how we have to wash ourselves in blood to, to have these sins eventually expiated or expunged. And now that we're speaking, we'll end with Lincoln because that flashes forward. One of the things he does when he does the Gettysburg Address is he does not exactly refer back to the Constitution as the founding of the country. He doesn't, he, and he should, but he doesn't. He, he, the first sentence uh, is, four score and seven years ago, our father, forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition all men are created equal. Well, as we've just said, they didn't bring forward a new nation in 1776. They brought forth a confederation of sovereign states provisionally united to, to win the war and then go their separate ways. The nation comes into existence in 1787-88 
with the convention and ratification. But as we've also said, even then, it's left unclear how national and how state-based this is. Um, and so when Lincoln is doing, as he's referring back not just to the Constitution, which has all these compromises, mm. but also to the Declaration, which in some ways gives us our founding ideals, and he wants to stress he wants those to get back ideals to that. Yeah. that all men are created equal. As he will say, this, I want to go back to the mystic chords of memory. Right? Thank you very much, Professor.